With the development of B-17 bombers, American planes could reach inside Germany to bomb its cities. For months, what became known as the 1,000 plane raids withstood the German Luftwaffe and accomplished their missions. James Wirth piloted a B-17, and Horst Petzler flew a Messerschmitt 109. They would play their parts on the battlefront. For many months, beginning in 1940, the Germans fly bombing runs over England to get the British to surrender. Their plan fails, and the English survive the devastating attacks. But in January 1943, the Allied leaders turn the tables. The terrors of sky warfare, first used by Germans, are now to be unleashed on Germany. The Allies prepare to drop two million tons of high explosives on strategic targets. Now, it's Germany's turn to be bombed into submission. The Americans flying by day and the British by night are organized into the combined bomber offensive. Their initial orders are to destroy the Luftwaffe in the air and on the ground. Until this objective is achieved, the planned invasion of Europe cannot be undertaken. The entire operation rests with the rugged and dependable B-17 bombers, the mainstay of American air fleets. Operating at altitudes of 25,000 feet, they are well able to hit any target in Germany, but are high enough to avoid gunfire from the ground. The airstrikes gather momentum as more crews and bombers are sent off by day and night from England. One American airman joining these attacks is B-17 pilot James Wirth. Going to Germany, unless we went up to northern Germany, Bremen, Kiel, up in there, we always cleared in over Holland. Almost always the same route, because we knew where their flak batteries were and we would go between flak batteries. My squadron particularly had great success. At one period they went six solid months in 1943 without losing an airplane. Normally going into a target we'd go at 20,000 feet and the indicated airspeed was 150 miles an hour which would give you about at 20,000 feet in those weather conditions probably 230 miles an hour to airspeed. I remember going uh, in the Ruhr, the flak was really bad. There were a lot of smoke in the sky from the flak. We were hit by pieces of flak, but never damaged. Not all the planes are as lucky. We'd have one bombardier in the group lead airplane would synchronize on the target. And uh, when his smokes came out from his airplane, why, we would release our bombs before we saw his bombs leave his bomb bay. One of the airmen now defending German skies has recently returned from the Eastern Front, Horst Petzler. I did not volunteer for it. There was always a request for certain jobs to be done, and the Eastern Front had to give up uh, pilots that had certain experience.
we were often for two, three hours on combat readiness, sitting on the plane and never get the takeoff uh, order. Other times we sat 10 minutes in and got immediately takeoff order, you know. We always had to take off when they came to central Germany. The fighter wing 3 Udet uh, covered that area to Berlin and to the north at North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And then we assembled over Magdeburg mostly or Braunschweig or Frankfurt and uh, were strictly let into the bomber formation from the front. We stayed away from rear attacks because they were too costly. Get in. Do your job and break up and, and, and get away from it to, to have clearance what the situation is. Face to face shooting, it's, it's tough, but it's still the shortest time and then you could really break away. I was hit in a wing, so I couldn't make a belly landing at all with, with that part of the wing off. I figured, prepare for bailout, and I did. of the American Daylight Air Offensive in Europe have proved discouraging to Allied planners. The cost has been high. In some raids, more than 20% of the B-17s are lost. Over Magdeburg, when I saw a B-17 go down with a uh, flag be, uh, hitting the, the B-17, on impact exploded, and there were, I think, three or four guys brought to the flag stand there. There was 8-8 flag. A lieutenant was the uh, commander there, and he tried to interrogate two other guys there. Uh, I think it was a pilot and a navigator, and uh, they didn't seem to understand each other. Their uniforms were not quite as good, you know, the fur boots and so, they were not the quality of ours, so we compared a little bit and we felt sorry in the way how they were equipped. Are you wounded? Uh, twisted ankle. Twisted ankle, but that's all. You can go up, bro. Back at their bases in England, pilots anxiously await the bomber squadrons returning from Germany. It was an easy airplane to fly. My problem with the B-17 was I had trouble lining up on the end of the runway. I found out there was a trick later on, just point the nose at the end of the runway and keep it pointed there and you would fly a curve into the runway, and that was sufficient to get you on the ground. They would take a lot of damage, they really would. The day I was wounded, our airplane had 210 impacts on it from enemy fighter aircraft, and it flew, and flew well. It leaked all the way home. You were a pilot on this first trip here today. Have you, can you give us a story on what you ran into right around the target or any enemy defenses? Well, Captain, we 
he approached the target over the river, practically on the target, where we ran into quite a bit of flak, dropped our bombs, looked like we did a lot of good, and did a hell of a lot of good. Well, uh, we were attacked by either some 190s or 109 E's. Three of them in formation, white. They dove down on us and then trooped up under. And West, the ball turret. Uh, Who's West, this boy here? Yes, he's my ball turret, man. We, he, he knocked one of them off, at least one, I'm pretty sure. 1944 begins with furious air assaults on the Luftwaffe forces, with new Mustang and Thunderbolt fighters arriving to accompany the B-17s in increasing numbers. Daylight bombing runs become much more effective. The Americans now have a powerful escort plane to protect their bombers. The funny thing of it all was to tell us from the highest level, ignore the escort fighters. It's easy to say, these gentlemen never flew these attacks, you know. And then we said, why don't we give once in a while the fighter escort a good lesson and, and really fire them, you know. Take one group and wipe a whole group out. That will teach the other ones a little bit more respect. Yeah? But ignoring them, just as if they were not there at all, that made them mad. By June, the Luftwaffe has lost many of its veteran pilots, and their young replacements lack experience in the air. The capacity of German airmen to interfere with Allied operations is drastically curtailed. The group was composed of three squadrons, and normally seven airplanes per squadron would make up the group. The lead squadron would form a V. You'd approach the target in that formation with the lead airplane, and then the airplane on his right wing being a little bit higher, and the airplane on his left wing being a little bit lower, and both behind. So every gun in the formation had a cone of fire that it was clear for it to fire. In September, the Germans give top priority to a newly developed retaliatory measure. The V-2 rocket is launched against England. The bomb-carrying rockets developed by Dr. Werner von Braun cannot be stopped by anti-aircraft gun or fighter planes because of their faster-than-sound speed. However, Londoners are determined to persevere through Hitler's latest offensive. Their stoic attitude is characterized by the saying, you'll always hear the one that's missed you, but never the one that's hit you. The Luftwaffe is also staking its future on the accelerated production of another weapon, the first jet plane, the revolutionary Messerschmitt 262. The few models that are operational prove what a potent threat they can be to the Allies, who have nothing to match them. German factories are set up underground to produce a thousand a month. The remaining ace fighters of the Luftwaffe are gathered together to fly them. The new planes can take off on short runways, and the average cruising speed is 900 kilometers an hour. Opened up, it can almost reach the speed of sound. With the new Messerschmitt to provide an air defense, Germans again expect to control the airspace over their homeland. By December 1944, the Allied Combined Bomber Offensive has established almost complete air superiority over Germany. The German commanders are forced to take desperate measures. The manufacturer of critical war goods is moved out of the cities to the countryside or relocated underground in bomb-proof shelters. With Germany's industrial output in chaos, it cannot provide replacement parts or planes for the Luftwaffe. The production of jet fighters comes to a halt. Despite the shortage created by the bombing, the Luftwaffe continues to resist. On New Year's Day, Germany's dwindling air units assemble for a major offensive against Allied airfields on the continent. Actually, when we were a group of 20 or 40, we were feeling pretty strong, you know, and uh, fear is not the right word. You, you fly, you do what you have to do, and. Uh, if it happens, it happens. One day your number is up. That's what, is how we saw it. Mm -hmm. 
dozens of Allied planes are destroyed or severely damaged. It is a daring but ultimately futile effort. The Allied air offensive continues to increase its power to destroy. No city, however small, is safe from destruction. All of Germany has become an open target. There is no longer such a thing as selective bombing. Over Frankfurt, there was a large Southern bomber raid. We were waiting for them already put in place to attack before they hit the target. We came right in from the front, so to disturb the uh, firepower of the bombers a little bit and, and make them spread out. and by day, German civilians are feeling the full impact of modern war. One and a half million tons of bombs have been dropped on Germany. A quarter of a million people have been killed as a result of the raids. And at least a half a million buildings totally destroyed. Germany, once a center of culture and enlightenment, has been bombed back to a primitive existence. Despite the devastation the endless tons of bombs bring to their cities, the Germans manage to keep their morale high. Our walls may crumble, but never our hearts, is the slogan planted over the rubble. The more the civilians got hit with the bomb war, the more the resistance uh, stiffened. Instead of breaking their moral, it stiffened. The uh, shots of bomber generals to break down the moral was the wrong way to, to handle the situation. People just don't believe. How do they treat us after the war is over when, when they do that right now? They have military targets and they bomb us. Yeah. And I learned a little bit of lesson in Berlin, being every night in the basement in protective air raid shelters. Okay, you can bomb everything upstairs, but you don't bomb our hearts. Germans have begun to live in underground networks of tunnels to produce food for the army. Although life goes on, many question the value of such an existence. With all basic service cut off, civilians chop down trees for firewood. Volunteers help clear the rubble from a once proud city. It is something which at least gives them some sense of purpose.
Germany is now a scarred landscape of ruined cities. Berlin, Hamburg, Dresden, Cologne, Frankfurt, Bremen, Mannheim, and many others. Even though most of Germany is destroyed, nothing can stop the B-17s from their mission. We turned back for weather, but never turned back for enemy action. In fact, the day I was wounded, weather turned back the second and third bomb division and all the fighters. And the first bomb division went into the target alone. And that's why we suffered such high casualties because the entire German Air Force had been launched. They were therefore able to concentrate all their firepower on just one division. I think we had 283 airplanes uh, and uh, had over 410 fighter attacks that day, lost 42. Victory in the air may be complete, but the war on the ground will continue a while longer. By now, the collapse of the Third Reich is assured. Its economy is in shambles, its armed forces destitute and immobilized, its industry out of commission. For pilots like James Worth, stationed in England, the end of the war comes on May 8th, 1945, VE Day. Their job has been done, and it's been done well. For them, the time has come to go home. As Allied forces fought their way up through Italy on the way to Rome, they encountered heavily fortified German positions on the Gustav Line. One disastrous stumbling block was an ancient hilltop monastery called Monte Cassino. The resulting carnage made this a brutal engagement no soldier would ever forget. Al Dietrich was with the 36th Texas Division. It was on this Italian hillside that he met the enemy on the battlefront. September 3, 1943, as Allied armies complete their conquest of Sicily, they prepare to invade Italy itself. Two divisions of the British 8th Army cross to the southern tip of Italy, where they encounter only minor German resistance. That same day, the Italian government surrenders. On September 9th, the 5th Army, composed of three American and three British divisions, launches an amphibious assault on the west coast of Italy at Salerno Bay, 30 miles south of Naples. One of the soldiers in combat for the first time with the 36th Texas Division is Al Dietrich. The invasion at Salerno Bay on September the 9th was, I imagine, like any other invasion, but we did not know what to anticipate. We knew we were going into combat, but what was combat? We had no idea, really. We had been conditioned to peak, and we were ready to go. Any more training, we would have been overtrained. So we were ready. I, uh, I knew I was going to go into combat now, and uh, this was going to be the beginning of the end of the war. For nearly a week, the Allies are surrounded by the Germans. However, the U.S. sends in air power, and combined with the big guns of the British Navy, they break out of the stranglehold. We had not been on shore hardly an hour when we heard the thunder of tanks. October 1st, the 5th Army marches victoriously into the city of Naples. It is an important strategic point because it will provide a perfect port for landing men and supplies once it is cleared of the destruction left behind by the Germans. There is confidence that the Allies will get to Rome within two months. However, the Germans mobilize all their units in Italy. They must be ready to counteract any Allied breakthrough. When the Allies invaded Italy, Adolf Hitler 
thought at first of uh, withdrawing all the German troops in southern Italy to the north. But uh, Kesselring, who was the uh, commander-in-chief in Italy, uh, talked him into letting him retreat slowly. Kesselring was successful in keeping the Allies to a very slow advance. Under Field Marshal Albert Kesselring's plan, the Germans are to make the Allied advance as costly as possible. Risking only small forces, they take hilltop positions in the Italian countryside. From these strongholds, they are able to strafe their attackers with impunity. When their own positions are seriously threatened, they simply withdraw a mile or two and repeat the process. They are always protected by the terrain, while the Allies are in the open, where they are hit over and over again. Every man has his own battle. There's a war out there and there's a battlefront. Your unit is committed, but you as an individual are committed. And you are going to encounter a enemy right in front of you. And that's what happened to me. October, 1943. The Allies are meeting progressively stiffer resistance in their push into the heart of Italy. The German withdrawal is not going to be a simple retreat. As they leave a position, engineers and labor battalions are building a strong defense barrier, which becomes known as the Gustav Line. The only thing in the Allies' favor is a strong and aggressive air force. But in mid-November, cold rain and even snow begins to fall. With these inclement flying conditions, the air force is of little help. Even on the ground, American tanks get bogged down in the mud. Before they even encounter the Gustav Line, the Allies recognize the slowing momentum and pause for some rest and regrouping. With Rome still 90 miles away and progress at a halt, none of the troops believe they will be in the Eternal City within two months. Meanwhile, everyone suffers from the conditions. The Leary Valley is the most critical defensive position on the Gustav Line. Monte Cassino, an 1,100-foot peak guards the entrance to the best approach to Rome through this valley. They had labor battalions that used to prepare defense positions if the Germans had to fall back to them. We didn't have that, but then again, we never really fell back. The Germans have placed large guns inside natural and man-made caves and have well-protected machine gun nests all over the mountain. Everywhere else, the slopes are lined with miles of barbed wire and thousands of anti-personnel mines. The most difficult issue for the Allies is the presence of an historic monastery sitting on top of the mountain. This site, holy to Christians all over the world, is where St. Benedict founded the Benedictine Order of Monks in the 6th century. If the Allies damage or destroy the structure in the heat of battle, they risk offending a large part of the religious world. December 1st, the move forward resumes. The 5th Army launches an attack on its next objective, a group of hills behind Monte Cassino. The key to this range is Monte Camino. In a major assault, nearly 1,000 big guns direct their fire on this hillside. The idea of the Germans being on the high points on the mountains in this terrible terrain meant that they could see the approaches. And there are few places in Italy where an army can't advance. And since the Germans could see those very clearly, it was very easy for them to block those routes of advance. And so Monte Cassino uh, was very important to the Germans. The Germans were quoted as saying, what did you hate most about the American army? And they said, the artillery. They just fired so many, so many shells at that mountain. I guess they call it Million Dollar Hill, yeah.
With the Million Dollar Hill taken, Americans advance to the more open country beyond Monte Camino. But the smaller hills are even more fortified and harder to take. It's not until the middle of January that the last of these hills falls. One mile away is the Rapido River, and right behind that lies Monte Casino. The 5th Army, using eight divisions, has taken six weeks to advance eight miles, suffering nearly 16,000 casualties. But now there's a new aggressive push. A simultaneous amphibious landing is set to take place at Anzio, 30 miles to the north. The troops already moving through the Italian hills must launch an immediate offensive against the Gustav Line to draw the German reinforcements away from the Anzio area. The 36th Division is to spearhead the drive. Troops like Al Dietrich are conserving their strength. You didn't wait for a night to sleep. There was a system that all our infantry units used, the buddy-buddy system. There's two of you per foxhole. One slept while the other one stayed on guard. And you decided among yourselves whether you want to sleep two hours or three or four. Our commanding general, General Walker, he says, it's been written that no river that has been used as a main line of defense has ever been breached in history. So I think that pretty well sums it up that there had to be a different strategy to cross that river or get to the enemy on the other side of that river. With the heavily fortified Monte Casino looking down on them, the troops have to hope there will be another strategy. On January 20th, 1944, Allied troops camped at the Rapido River make a concerted attack on the Gustav Line at the German stronghold of Monte Cassino. They want to break through the line, but they must also create a diversion and tie up German units while other American and British soldiers make a landing at Anzio. The toughest assignment falls to the 36th Division. Uh, the regiment jumped off on schedule. Every man was supposed to carry an extra battle air ammunition across with him, uh, which is like an invasion. This is an invasion across the river of the enemy side, just like coming in Salerno, you brought extra ammunition. They managed to get the most of one battalion across, but the other battalions had difficulty, the same as the 141st. Artillery, poor visibility, equipment getting shot up, then getting demoralized, lost sense of direction. The Germans could hear the movement of some 1,500 to 2,000 troops moving in the night, and they had pre-registered all of their artillery on that river, and they just opened up. German artillery prevents the building of a pontoon bridge across the river. All boats, footbridges, and telephone wires are destroyed. The men who have gotten to the German side of the river run out of ammunition. They try to return, but only the strong swimmers are able to get to safety. In this operation, 1,681 men of the Texas Division are lost. The only benefit of the battle is that the Allied assault on Casino succeeds in bringing more German reinforcements to the Gustav Line and making the landing at Anzio easier. Still bogged down, the Allies plan a second attack on Monte Cassino, but the question of the monastery on top of the mountain plagues the Allies. The bombing of the monastery, uh, I agree with General Walker, our commander, said, well, the Abbey is not being manned by Germans, so they're just observers, but if we bomb the Abbey and destroy it, they still remain up there. The height is still there. You can't flatten the mountain. The decision is made that the 10-foot thick walls will give the Germans a second line of defense, so the monastery must be bombed. On February 14th, leaflets are dropped to the abbot, five monks, and 200 refugees living in the monastery. They are warned that the site will be attacked and no specific date is given. The 80-year-old abbot asks the Germans to provide an escort to safety. He is assured they will have their escort within two days. The next day, with everyone still inside the monastery, both the Allied troops and the Germans hear the sound of bombers approaching.
bomb in the Abbey certainly uh, was on target. It completely destroyed it. But later, as General Clark said, you can't move the enemy out with bombing alone. You have to have infantry go in. And when all the dust settled and the infantry tried to make their moves, the Germans were still there. Since no one has been notified of the timing of the air assault, the unprepared British troops see this as an opportunity to attack. But they are at half strength, and their advance comes with a terrible cost in lives. They advance on the north to within 1,000 yards of Monte Cassino and the railroad station on the south end of the town of Cassino. But they can advance no further. The second attack on Monte Cassino has ended in a deadlock. When the bombing failed to result in taking the hill, the Germans moved into the monastery, and so they used the ruined abbey now as a defensive position. March 15th, the Germans still hold the town of Casino at the foot of the mountain. 500 Allied planes hit the town with 1,400 tons of bombs. Strategic bombers, as their names imply, are used really to, to take out industry and to take out uh, the civilian will to resist. But here, this was an, an experiment of sorts. This is the first time that they were used in support of ground troops. In the wake of the surprise bombing, a full-scale attack is launched against the stunned enemy. Finally, Monte Cassino falls. Indian Gurkha troops clamber halfway up Monte Cassino itself to occupy a spur of the mountain called Hangman's Hill. It looks like victory is inevitable, but bad luck prevails. A reserve battalion fails to receive orders to join the assault. The initial momentum is lost. The German 1st Paratroop Division seizes the opportunity to swarm down the mountain slopes to counterattack Allied strong points. The condition of the German troops was excellent. They had turned back two very strong Allied attacks. The Gustav line was still in operation. It was still invulnerable. It was still impregnable. And the German soldiers were in excellent condition. They just felt they had, they had to turn back the Allies and uh, nobody could dispossess them of that ground. On March 23rd, the third offensive against Monte Cassino is called off as winter descends on Italy. During the following weeks, there are no major actions. Sitting out the bad weather, the Allied commander in Italy, British General Sir Harold Alexander, strengthens his forces along the Gustav Line. The Germans think he has six divisions, but he is able to assemble 13. You have to do things in combat uh, that uh, you don't, well, you don't know what the outcome is going to be, really. And, but you have to try them sometime. Uh, the bombing of the Abbey, to me, was nothing as compared to the crossing of the Rapido, where so many lives were at stake. On May 11th, the final major assault begins. Between the sea and the mountains, the U.S. Second Corps on the left flank moves forward, but is stopped. To its right, the French Corps treks over the Arunsi Mountains to catch the Germans by surprise. It threatens to weaken the Leary Valley defenses. In the center, the 13th British Corps crosses the Rapido below Casino. And to the north, the Polish Corps swings behind Monte Cassino.
eyes finally took Monte Cassino in the month of May. What General Alexander did was to move the 8th Army from the east coast of Italy across the mountains over into the west part of Italy. And so you had the 5th and the 8th Armies concentrated and they attacked in May. There was a French corps of soldiers and the French outflanked the defenders of Monte Cassino. Once you cut off a position, you know, those people, they have two options. They can surrender or they can try to get out. And so once the French cut the Leary Valley, then that was the time for the Germans to retire. The Polish and British troops closed their pincers behind Monte Cassino on May 18th. But the German garrison escapes, slipping out just before the gap is closed. It is the Polish Corps which finally takes possession of Monte Cassino. The only Germans they find are the wounded left behind to surrender. The Germans retreat to a secondary defense position six miles behind the Gustav Line, the Adolf Hitler Line. But the Allied push is relentless and unstoppable. The Germans go into headlong retreat. Along with the American 5th Army's victory at Anzio, the Allied troops push on through Italy. On June 4th, 1944, the American 5th Army marches into Rome. Two days later, on D-Day, the other armies of the Allies land in Normandy. Overshadowed by the monumental invasion on the French coast, the Battle of Cassino is just another episode of World War II. Soon after Cassino, Al Dietrich would be transferred out of combat infantry. I was assigned to a, a Arden Transport Company transferring uh, armor to uh, armored units, tanks, half tracks. I always felt for the infantryman because I knew what he was going through. I think that living as the infantryman has to live is even harder than dying. The Battle of Monte Cassino is remembered by many for its destruction of a historic place of worship. But others honor the tremendous sacrifice of soldiers from many nations who are willing to give their lives in the service of their countries. It also serves to remind future generations that on a battlefront, there is no shortage of destruction and suffering. After the invasion of Sicily, the Allied armies headed for a little Italian fishing town called Anzio. But the Germans, entrenched in the hills, would not let them get off the beach. It took three months of fierce battle to break out of the stalemate. Ted Fleeser was with an American artillery unit. This is where he met the enemy, on the battlefront. In July 1943, Allied armies, fresh from victories in North Africa, launch an invasion on the island of Sicily. Their objective, to push the Germans back to the Italian mainland and force Italy to surrender. The Germans throw as much artillery as they can to hold on to Sicily. But American Navy guns are a potent and deadly counterforce. Finishing bombardment, the Germans have little choice but to withdraw. American GIs move in and take control of the island. Over 60,000 German soldiers are evacuated to conserve their army strength. Then, Allied forces gain a foothold on mainland Italy, capturing Naples. The plan is to move up the Italian coast to make an end run through the German defenses of the Gustav Line, which cuts the country in half. 
110,000 men, troops of the 3rd Army Division, the British 1st, paratroopers, commandos, and U.S. Rangers are designated as the 6th Army Corps. One of the Rangers is a young rifleman, Ted Fleeser. At that time, I was in the D Company of 1st Ranger Battalion. I was a BAR gunner. Rank was T5, Corporal. I'd been in North Africa, joined the Rangers there, participated in the invasion of Sicily with them and through the Sicilian campaign, then the invasion of Italy. Landing craft for the operation are a special problem. In short supply and in great demand because of stockpiling for the Normandy invasion, they are on loan only through February. The attack date for Anzio is set for January 22nd, 1944. In Rome, the commander of the German forces in Italy, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, is confronted with a dilemma. Responsible for defending the entire Italian coast from an Allied invasion, he has long maintained two divisions near Rome, ready to move quickly against any landing by sea. But now he needs to reassign them to help defend the Gustav Line, which is under attack at Monte Cassino. This leaves a potential weak spot at Anzio. January 21st, 35,000 men of the Allied 6th Army Corps step aboard their transport ship at Naples. Anzio is 90 miles north. The morning of January 22nd, a great fleet of 253 ships approaches the beaches of Anzio. The soldiers on board represent a cross-section of American society. You had anything from a preacher to a uh, bouncer, boxer, people in general, normal people. Well, these two brothers had hitched hike up from Florida to Detroit. Uh, this was in 39. Walked over the Peace Bridge and enlisted in the Canadian forces. The three of us, we had been together since North Africa. To the amazement of everyone, the opening waves of the invasion force is unopposed. As the landing crafts take the men in, they are met only by an empty beach. The first troops are able to land without even getting their feet wet. The Germans allowed the Allies to land so easily at Anzio and Natuno because there weren't any Germans there. The Germans had been taken out of that area to reinforce the Gustav Line because the British troops threatened to penetrate the Gustav Line. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the Allies took about 70 casualties when they went in, which is practically nothing. Well, happily, things were quiet the day we landed there. The Germans were in short supply on ammunition, and so were we. Most everything was diverted for preparation for the invasion at Normandy. The first objectives of the operation are to establish a beachhead and then to advance over the plain to the Alban Hills, six miles from the beach and commanding the approaches to Rome. Although the way ahead appears open, the entire 6th Army Corps is ordered to dig in. Overhead, Allied fighters and bombers fly in to take out bridges and road crossings. They make 1,200 sorties on this day alone. Kesselring responds quickly to the invasion force at Anzio. Only three hours after they make land, he orders Luftwaffe anti-aircraft batteries and every other available reinforcement to surround the beachhead. The Luftwaffe arrives on the scene first, but does not have the aircraft in fuel to derail the landing force.
Finally, on January 26th, the 6th Army Corps is ordered to expand the beachhead toward the Alban Hills and Rome. But in the time that they have been establishing their positions, the Germans have built a hastily thrown together army, 40,000 strong, to block their way. Hitler was, was terribly shocked by the landing at Anzio because he thought that it was a rehearsal for an invasion of Normandy or somewhere in the western, western part of Europe. And if that was really a rehearsal, then he needed to get rid of it to prove to the Allies that they would be unable to cross the channel. Uh, the Germans had the high ground and could see anything that was taking place on the beachhead. Since they had been in this position previous to us, they had it all taped. That is, they knew where any logical positions were, so they were able to lay in on us beautifully and heavily. We were being used pretty much solely as artillery at that time so we would be giving supporting fire to whatever was required. 10 days after the invasion, the American 3rd Division has suffered 3,000 casualties. On February 3rd, under orders from Hitler to lance the abscess south of Rome, the Germans massed 90,000 troops for a full-scale counterattack. They brought troops from everywhere. That is, they brought divisions from southern France, from northern Italy, from Germany and from the Balkans, and they sent them with highest priority transportation to Italy to oppose the Anzio landings. They were terribly afraid that the Allies would move to the Alban Hills about six or eight miles beyond the beaches. The Germans try to repeat their success at Dunkirk when they surrounded and defeated 400,000 British and French soldiers. For two weeks, with heavy shelling and fighting, the armies fight it out. soldiers at uh, Anzio were excellently trained. They were good troops, uh, and, and, and they, were, they thought they were winning in Italy. The fighting on Anzio was the worst of any in the European theater throughout the war. Uh, there was nothing so fierce, nothing so close, Nowhere else was there hand-to-hand -hand fighting and at short range as there was at Anzio. Every day, under constant bombardment, the Allied position looks worse. Germans are closing in. The hope for a quick victory is evaporating. After four days of battle at Anzio, the Germans suffer more than 5,000 casualties. The Americans, nearly 4,000. The Allies order every bomber in Italy to the Anzio front. The saturation bombing makes the difference. March 1st, the Germans call a halt to the fighting. Weary troops, cold, wet, and hungry, both German and Allied, dig in and wait. Neither side has the strength to win. Anzio and Atuno are on a plain, uh, and it's a marshy plain, and there isn't much there. And uh, as a consequence, the Germans were supplied uh, as they usually were. Uh, sometimes uh, everything got through okay and sometimes things did not get there so that food was sometimes short. The weather torments both armies during the winter months. All they can do is dig out of the mud as it rains six days a week.
the weather in, at the time of Anzio uh, was rather inclement. Rain, cold. No, it was not pleasant. It was not sunny Italy. We had enjoyed sunny Italy in Sicily. At that time, it was lovely. Meanwhile, the Germans used the lull to entrench their defenses further. Although there are food shortages, they are in for the long haul. The German ground soldiers were well trained. And there is a tradition, it seems to me, it's almost a medieval tradition, that the soldiers, the German soldiers, uh, fight well and, and they obey orders. Their discipline is excellent, and so is their leadership. There isn't much information really available. You know only what's taking place in your immediate vicinity. Bill Walden, the cartoonist, covered it most beautifully when he referred to the most important place on this front is where you are. As the weather clears on March 2nd, the Allied Air Forces stage the biggest air attack of the campaign. Nearly a thousand fighters and bombers come in to smash German strongpoints. The results of the bombing destroys German hopes for another major counteroffensive. By the end of March, more than 120,000 Allied soldiers are jammed into the artillery ringed pocket they nickname Hell's Half Acre. They are unable to break out, but they manage to tie up 135,000 German troops desperately needed on other crumbling fronts. For nearly three months, both sides fight a defensive battle. The lines are broken, then retaken, then penetrated again. What began as a big attack gives way to small skirmishes, but there are still large numbers of casualties. The line between the Germans and the Allies was, was one that was very close, hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting. There was uh, firing at very close ranges, and the stalemate reigned, and uh, both sides decided there was nothing they could do to change the situation. And so both sides backed off a little bit, and a stalemate descended over the Anzio plain. The lack of progress has its effect on the Americans. Although lives are being lost, no ground is gained. After moving rapidly through Sicily, the Anzio battle is a frustrating exercise in warfare. The encircled men of the Anzio pocket find themselves sitting ducks during German bombardments. One of the most destructive weapons they encounter is a giant railway cannon that hurls 11-inch shells into the beachhead. The Germans uh, had a gun that they apparently called Leopold. The uh, Allies on the beachhead called it Anzio Annie. This was a long-range gun of very heavy caliber. The Germans kept it in a tunnel, in a railroad tunnel. And so uh, Allied planes searching for this gun were unable to see it. And they usually rolled it out of the tunnel at nightfall when planes they couldn't discover what was going on on the ground, and they launched these shells uh, that devastated the, uh, the Allied positions on that marshy plain. By the middle of May, the long, deadly winter has loosened its grip on Italy. As the Allied armies in the south open their spring offensive, the trapped men of Anzio must break out of Kesselring's steel grip or suffer defeat.
With a strong Allied push, the Germans begin to withdraw. Kesselring must keep his troops optimistic in the face of bad news from other fronts. Obviously, it's uh, not very encouraging to retreat, to retire, to pull back, to give up ground, to withdraw. I think the propaganda was very strong, and I think uh, Germans were persuaded, for example, that uh, uh, New York had been bombed, that the United States was under constant attack, uh, that the Germans were winning the war against Russia. Hitler kept promising uh, miracle weapons. I suppose if, if the German soldiers believed Adolf Hitler, they felt that they still had a chance to achieve victory in World War II, although it's very difficult in retrospect to, to see how that would have been possible. When the Germans start surrendering, the first prisoners are those who have been left to hold the lines, teenagers who are thrown in to stop the Allied advance. The breakout is complete. After two days of the most vicious fighting, Cisterna falls on May 25th. On that same red-letter day, a long-awaited event occurs. The troops at Anzio finally link up with the American 5th Army, which has broken through the Gustav Line. For the Allies, the tide is turning, but not without cost. The combined Allied army suffers more than 4,000 casualties in a week. Some Germans, however, even in retreat, are still willing to fight. And soldiers fight to stay alive because when someone is trying to kill you, you're going to kill him first. And I think the right to survive is what soldiers everywhere, why they fight. That's the actuality. As the Americans break through the German lines, their morale is suddenly boosted sky high. All that is on their minds is getting to Rome, 37 miles away. Under increasing pressure, the entire German front begins to break. By June 2nd, the Germans are in full retreat, and the Allies are sweeping victoriously north to Rome. When the Germans gave up Rome, they retreated, or they withdrew. We think of retreat as being disorderly, but the Germans instituted a very orderly withdrawal, but they carried it off very well. Two days later, on June 4th, amidst a jubilant welcome, the Eternal City is liberated. Our force uh, did uh, go to Rome, the first special service force, was accredited with being the first into Rome. That's disputed by some other units, of course, but that's common state. Ted Fleiser would move with the Allied forces into southern France, where he would take part in Operation Dragoon. He would later work with the Rocketdyne Division of Rockwell International. The failure to advance immediately from the beach at Anzio and on towards Rome while the German defenses are weakest leads to some of the fiercest fighting at the Gustav Line fortress of Monte Cassino. Because of this, Anzio is, in the opinion of many experts, a costly mistake. But like the rest of the war, no battle is won without a price to pay. With Allied victories in Italy, the tide of the war has continued to turn against the Axis powers. The time has come for the Allies to break into France and push the Germans back to their own border. The war will now move into the resort towns of southern France, the French Riviera. Ted Fleiser was with the U.S. 45th Infantry Division. This is where he would meet the enemy, on the battlefront. Since 1943, with Allied victories in Italy, German troops have been reassigned to shore up defenses in France and Germany. The D-Day landings at Normandy bring Allied armies right into France.
By August 1944, two months after the D-Day invasion, the Allies have consolidated their forces. Now they head east to break down German defense positions. The further the Allies drive into France, the more vulnerable they become. To protect themselves, a secondary offensive is ordered. The invasion of southern France. Operation Dragoon is to land Allied troops east of Marseille and Toulon on the Mediterranean coast and to open a new battlefront on the French Riviera. The landing beaches and their approaches are chartered to perfection and the deployment of enemy troops is no secret. The Maquis, the French resistance forces, report every movement. Three American and two French divisions are withdrawn from Italy. These will become the nucleus of the invasion force. They are rolled into the 7th Army under the leadership of Lieutenant General Alexander Patch. To minimize the continuing problem of inter-service rivalries, the entire assault command is given headquarters aboard one ship, the USS Catoctin. On board for the invasion is a veteran who has just recovered from injuries he received at Anzio, Corporal Ted Fleeser with the 1st Ranger Battalion. After securing Rome, we prepared for southern France since the function of the 1st Special Service Force, which was part of the 1st Allied Airborne Task Force, was to take out, prior to the main landings, a couple of islands off of Toulon. They had the coastal defense guns on these islands, which would have impeded the landing. This company was unique in the First Special Service Force in that it was an all-ranger company absorbed as a unit into the force. So they were all men who had been in action, for, at least in Sicily. The Germans are expecting the landings in southern France. General Johannes Blockowitz stations 30,000 troops in the assault zone. They are ordered to hold the invaders for a few days until the Allies have tipped off their main landing area. Then 200,000 more German troops will move in to counterattack. It was quite secure. They also had guns to fire out to sea, of course. Retractable cupolas for their forward observers. Their accommodations were quite luxurious. As Wehrmacht combat troops are deployed throughout key defense sectors, various support units are alerted to move to southern France. Well, wherever you have a mechanized army, you have to have support units to, take, uh, to keep the tanks rolling. Uh, military equipment takes a beating, and it takes support services, it takes technicians. The support units also experimented with weaponry, trying to figure out ways to use ordinary machines as lethal weapons, and they actually came up with a remote-controlled anti-tank device. When they were needed in the front lines, the mechanics and the engineers could be transferred into uh, fighting units. So these units were following the Panzers wherever they went. The Germans were very anxious to keep the uh, population and the, and the army from knowing just how precarious the situation was. So they were never told uh, what was going on. But when they got to France and they found that things were not going well, these were many of these were young men who had never been out of Germany before in their lives. Uh, but many of them had fathers who had fought in World War I and been killed in World War I or earlier in World War II, and uh, they knew all too well that the risk was that they might wind up the same way. So uh, the morale was not as good as it would have been had the uh, soldiers not been on the scene and seen what the Allies were throwing against them. There is no hope of surprising the Germans, but efforts are made to keep the exact landing sector a secret. 
Bombers of the Mediterranean Allied Air Force hit selected stretches of coastline, but only one of them is the intended assault area. August 14th, the main convoys pass between the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. Barrage balloons protect the ships from low-flying enemy planes. But in truth, the Germans have little air power available to them from their depleted Luftwaffe. At dusk, the ships change course and head for their destination, Toulon and Cannes. Chaplains of the different faiths gather the men together while still at sea. The soldiers know at this point that they are committed to battle. They also know there's no guarantee about getting out of this with their lives. It gives them time for reflection. And at times like this, many of the men are more than willing to acknowledge their religious beliefs. Before the landing, underwater demolition teams, also known as frogmen, do their part to prepare for the invasion. When the job is completed, they're retrieved in a way that prevents them from becoming a stationary target if they're under fire. couldn't bring our half-tracks in on the islands like that. We landed on the mainland, and that was the first place I saw the rocket launchings from the landing craft and the rolling thunders impact on the beach. On August 15th, invasion day, small commando groups on each flank set out for shore. Meanwhile, 400 transport planes carrying over 5,000 paratroopers are flying over the Mediterranean. Operation Dragoon, the invasion of southern France, has begun. August 15, 1944, the invasion is underway. The Gold Coast of the French Riviera, once the playground of Europe's elite, is under attack by invading Allied armies. Nine miles inland, 5,000 paratroopers of the 1st Airborne Division make a drop near the town of Limoy. Then come hundreds of glider-borne reinforcements. Landing behind the German lines creates a chaotic situation for the enemy. French commandos land on the left flank, east of Cap Negre, wipe out a coastal battery and block the road to Toulon in a letter-perfect operation. The Germans heard of the Allied attacks at the Côte d'Azur and that the landings were, were going on. The specialized units were put into battle. The uh, panzers rushed in from the Italian fronts. The repair units had to improvise because there were very few spare parts and a lack of supplies a lack of reserves. These people realized what a terrible shortage there was of parts and gasoline. And they knew to fight without the parts, without the supplies, was extremely risky.
While the naval barrage softens up the enemy on the beach, the landing crafts wait offshore out of range of German artillery. The rendezvous continues for hours. Then, finally, they head to the beach. 8 a.m. All of the different divisions head to their landing points on the beach. A message is sent to headquarters on the USS Catoctin that the landings are on time and the opposition is light. As the landing crafts head for shore, the men have a few anxious moments to ponder their fate. Then the adrenaline kicks in. There's a positive sign. The fire coming in at them is not as bad as they expected. cleared the beach nicely. I had participated in the invasion of Sicily back with the Rangers. This was much easier. Our function was on landing after the tracks were available. We drove eastward to the French-Italian border. In the early stages, it is a battle of isolated actions. Until the pieces fall into place, headquarters does not know how it stands. It does not even know that its paratroopers have, by chance, landed right next to the headquarters of the German Corps guarding the assault beaches. They're able to take several hundred prisoners, including the Corps commander. The 45th Division captures the German signal center for the south coast. With these losses, the Germans' top leadership and communications are cut off at the critical moment. For the Allies, it has been a smooth operation. The line companies, the riflemen, would be in advance and so forth. However, that was not the case with our type of unit. We would be in front of the riflemen. We would be doing our own reconnaissance for the force in general. And that's why we were the first in to liberate some of these places rather than it being a rifle company. The 6th Corps, under Lieutenant General Lucian Truscott, quickly sweeps over the two German divisions facing the assault beaches. German morale on the continent finally appears to be cracking. German morale was, was getting shaky in southern France. The best German units were on the eastern front and fighting in northern France. So a lot of the troops in southern France were not the very best troops in the German army. And over 2,000 of them surrendered on the first day of strong fighting. Even more surrendered the next day. We had one fellow with us. He had been born in Berlin. There was a whole company of Germans. He was able to talk them into surrendering to our cannon company. The collapse of the beachhead defenses comes too fast for General Blockowitz to rush in reserves. Now he finds, with all the bridges down over the Rhone, his troops are divided into two uncoordinated forces, east and west of the river. The Germans on the southern front knew that the Americans were advancing, and some were being pinned down by French resistance fighters. Whenever the Germans moved or tried to hide or tried to make a move, the French villagers of the resistance would inform the Americans where they were and what they were doing, and bombers would come over these, uh, the German units so that uh, the German army was splintered and uh, the resistance had a, a great deal of, a, of impact, not only as a fighting unit, but as an intelligence unit. Success has come too quickly in the operation. The Germans have no cohesive plan of retreat, and the Allies have no practical plan of advance. Improvising, General Truscott determines to cut off the Germans and order his columns northwest to the Rhone River. Their objective is to wipe out enemy pockets of resistance. However, there's very little of the enemy left to fight. There are the occasional small holding forces. 
The Germans are leaving just enough men behind to hold off the Americans from catching up with them. This type of fighting is so easy, the men call it the Champagne Campaign. In going through France, while we were doing the liberating, one town, a girl was getting a haircut for collaborating with the Germans, and she kept saying, c'est pas vrai, it's not true. But the OSS had been operating in the area, and for all I know, this girl might have been helping them underground, thereby appearing to be collaborating, but not. And then she was doubly suffering. The best German escape route is through a narrow gap north of the town of Montelamar. A 1,000-foot high ridge overlooks the pass. Truska determines to take the ridge before the Germans get there. The first troops to reach the Montelamar area on August 21st attack the town instead of the all-important ridge. Thousands of Germans squeak through the gap. The battle around Montelamar continues for seven days, with the Germans getting much of the worse of it. By the time the bombing at Montlemar uh, took place, the Germans were completely demoralized and the bombing was the, the last straw. They headed for their vehicles and they dropped their guns because you couldn't get home on a gun and you might get home on a, on a vehicle. Meanwhile, other American troops have encircled too long while the French Maquis come out into the open to battle the Germans in Marseille. The French quickly round up German sympathizers and collaborators. August 23rd, the Maquis gain control of the city of Marseille. It is a time for joy and sorrow. The people who live here know the tide has finally turned. The French were quite happy to see us. I have this photo of our half-track going through Nice and the civilians all around us obviously happy. Civilians gave us the little circular, a tricolored circle that they were wearing and wanted us to wear. After waiting four years for this moment, the Free French Army returns in victory. September 11th, both American and French columns now harass the Germans as they race towards their border. Patrols of the 7th Army and General Patton's 3rd Army make contact near the town of Châtillon and the Allies regroup for the invasion of Germany. The shattered units of the German Army limp back to their homeland in retreat. It had to be bittersweet for them. Uh, after all, they were going back home, for one thing, but on the other hand, they were going back home as defeated troops and they knew that the Allies were going to be attacking Germany and that uh, the war would, was not over, but that uh, Germany was certainly not likely to win at that point. And uh, they knew all too well that they'd seen the size of the Allied uh, forces and they'd seen the, uh, the supplies and the air power. And so they knew that uh, Germany was on its last legs. 
In southern France, the Germans have suffered a humiliating defeat. Some die for what they believe, but more of them, upwards of 100,000, surrender. At long last, the German war machine is breaking down. They knew that it was probably better to surrender to the Americans than to be sent to the Eastern Front against the Russians, who were merciless. So when they had a chance to surrender, it looked like a good deal to a lot of them, and they did. These were people who knew all too well what they were up against, and uh, surrender was an attractive option. One of the rewards for veterans of southern France is a place for R&R, the French Riviera town of Nice. We'd have a room to sleep in, food would be cooked, and so forth, and other accommodations and facilities that we did not normally encounter. And so it was quite pleasant. Ted Fleeser would return to the United States and find a career with the Rocketdyne Division of Rockwell International. He has served his time on the battlefront. In mid-1943, the Allied armies, fresh from successful campaigns in retaking North Africa, prepared for their first entry into Europe. Sicily was the landing point, and American forces ran into stiff opposition from tank and machine gun units of the Italian army. It was a battle royale as the Allies met the Axis head-on. Stanley Jubin was a colonel in the U.S. Army. It was here on the island of Sicily that he met the enemy on the battlefront. On May 13, 1943, General Sir Harold Alexander, commander of British forces in North Africa, reports to Prime Minister Winston Churchill that the Tunisian campaign is over. The Allied forces have defeated the Axis armies of Germany and Italy. The Allies now set their sights on knocking Italy out of the war. General Dwight Eisenhower has developed a plan for the invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky. Beginning with an airborne drop on the night of July 9th, during the period of a favorable moon. When the Germans and Italians receive reports of a huge buildup of ships and troops in North Africa, they suspect an invasion is in the works. But they do not know the exact location that will be struck on the European continent. Well, Sicily was an obvious target, but it was only one of the possibilities that the Germans had to consider. Sardinia, Sicily, Greece, Turkey, any of those were possibilities. Adolf Hitler, who remembered that Winston Churchill had been preoccupied with the Balkans in the First World War, assumed that they would probably go to the Eastern Mediterranean rather than to Sicily. British naval intelligence uses a ruse to influence Axis thinking. They plant the dead body of a fictitious Major William Martin on the coast of Spain. The corpse carries false documents that the intended invasion points are Greece and Sardinia. The cleverly devised plan fools Adolf Hitler, who orders troops and materials diverted to Greece. On July 9, 1943, a huge amphibious assault force leaves from several North African ports. Aboard one of the troop carriers is a colonel in the 39th Engineers Battalion attached to a special ranger force, Stanley Jubin. We trained like crazy. We did a lot of amphibious assault training because we knew we were going to cross the Mediterranean to some place. A lot of time, the training is harder than the actual battle. You really train up to the hilt and uh, you get all hyped up and it's almost a release of the tension to get moving and move towards uh, the job that you were preparing for. But uh, the specifics only became known to us at our level, perhaps in the 10 or 15 days preceding the uh, invasion of Sicily. Aboard the ships, troops are treated to a broadcast of German propaganda, hosted by Axis Sally. You boys are always Sally's favorites. But I'm not happy with you this morning. You're up to something. Last night you sneaked away from Africa. The American 1st Division embarked from five points. But already one of its regiments is lost. Seems a torpedo hit their ship. 
This makes me quite sad. I hope no harm comes to the rest of you. That would be terrible, wouldn't it, George? George, speak to the boys. Easy there, Yank. There's danger ahead. We all thought of home and what our families were doing, and we leaned heavily on the, I guess it was called V-mail, that was processed. All of us as officers had a particularly good sensing of how the men felt and what they were thinking about because we were required to censor their letters. Suddenly, winds of almost gale proportions blast across the Mediterranean, prompting the high command to consider postponing the assault and returning to port. But after some consideration, operation commanders decide to ride out the storm and keep going. On the ship, a lot of the folks didn't have much time to worry about, about the invasion itself. They were not feeling all that great because of the conditions. We had rough weather, and um, that coupled with the oil fumes of the diesel engines uh, had us, some of the boys a little seasick. By evening, the gamble the command has taken pays off. The coast of Sicily is dead ahead. The troops are finally given their landing orders. They are to invade Sicily on a beach near the town of Jela. The town of Jela is right on the coast and back inland about five or six miles it was an airport. And it was pretty obvious that the airport was gonna be an, an early target so that uh, our airplanes could establish a base there and not have to fly over from North Africa on their missions. But generally, uh, the mission was to capture the island, capture as many troops as we could, and, and uh, clear the island as quickly as we could. The Axis commanders on Sicily had to know that Sicily was a likely target, and they made serious preparations to defeat an invasion. General Sanger and Guzzoni the German and Italian commanders on the island were aware from reconnaissance reports that the Allied shipping was preparing and assembling for invasion somewhere. About midnight on the 9th of July, 1943, General Guzzoni learned of the air airborne drops by British and American troops. And at that point, he alerted all his troops and correctly anticipated the beaches that would actually be used for the invasion. However, what he could not know was the strength, the size of the invasion force. While 3,000 paratroopers scatter along a 60-mile line, Navy ships wait offshore. The Army has opposed naval gunfire as an aid to the landing. The boats lined up abreast of each other and headed for the shore. As uh, we approached the shore, we could hear the machine gun firing. We were to land on either side of a pier that jutted out from the town of jail. And there were machine gun positions right on the end of this pier. So they took us under fire even before we got into the beach. But it was a great relief to see that pier because that's exactly where we were supposed to be. And so we knew we were landing in the right place and going to be able to have a good start on accomplishing our mission. The battle gets so hot on the invasion beach that the beachmaster requests all landings be held up. The Navy guns finally get their chance. smoke screen, all remaining troop landing crafts reach the beach by 8 a.m.
as soldiers clamber ashore, they begin the trek inland towards the town of Jela. Along the way, there's plenty of resistance from the Germans. Americans continue to push forward, trapping the enemy in low-lying pockets of the hills. took a task force of two half-tracks and about 15 men out, seeing how far we could advance inland uh, before we ran into resistance. And uh, we soon did. We ran into some anti-tank mines on the road, which destroyed the lead tank in which I was located, flipped it over on its side. And we found that uh, there was an Italian machine gun about 100 yards up the road that had us under fire. Of course, in any event, we didn't have the equipment to be able to right this half-track, which had pinned one of the men down to the ground. He couldn't, couldn't be released. And I released him by cutting off his arm and hauling him back to the town of jail and to medical facilities. The Germans' flight desperately needed reinforcements to the embattled island. Among the highly disciplined troops is the 1st Parachute Division. Once the Allies had captured North Africa in 1943, it was only a matter of time before they would invade the continent of Europe itself. The island of Sicily, which is on the shortest distance between Tunisia and the Italian peninsula, is a logical stepping stone, a, a logical preparation to go to Italy itself. So losing Sicily would be, for the Germans, the first step in losing Italy and the entire Mediterranean basin. The paratroopers land according to their plan. What they do not expect is an attack of British Spitfires before they even leave the drop zone. takes a heavy toll. The Germans regroup and board trucks that will transport them to Syracuse. Meanwhile, General Alfredo Guzzoni, commander of the Axis forces in Sicily, launches a counterattack of armor and infantry across the Jela plain toward the beach. He is confident the Allied beachhead at Jela will be destroyed by nightfall. July 10th, 1943. The Allied invasion of Sicily is only hours old, but the landings have run into stiff opposition as German and Italian armor counterattacks in strength. American infantry puts in a desperate call for more supporting fire from the Navy. With the first column of panzers just three miles from the beach, destroyers open with fire that presents a considerable deterrent to the enemy. would start their counterattacks. They first attacked with a group of uh, about five tanks that were pretty old model tanks and they were pretty, pretty easily stopped with our uh, bazookas and our anti-tank guns. They gave up pretty easily. They came under heavy fire and they surrendered quite readily. As we got into the town, there, there tended to be a little bit more resistance. The Italians were, were uh, uh, moving from building to building. It was city, city type fighting. While the Americans are moving forward, the Eastern British Task Force, under command of General Bernard Montgomery, is facing stiffer air attack than the Americans. Axis fighter planes have complete air control over this sector. Under the barrage, the British make their way to the shore.
German divisions weren't in immediate contact. They were held back in sort of in reserve, and our, all our immediate contacts for the first few days were with Italian troops. Their heart wasn't in the war. They were ready to give up fairly easily. German soldiers had, frankly, two contradictory opinions about the Italian army. On the one hand, the troops in Sicily, the Italian troops, uh, with their poor morale and poor equipment, uh, had marginal military value. On the other hand, the Germans realized they didn't have enough troops to defend the area by themselves. And the German and Italian commanders had worked very well together in the early stages of the defense of the island. So Germany was surprised by the Italian surrender, and Hitler found that he had to pour a large number of troops into the Italian peninsula and into Sicily to take the place of the Italian allies he had lost. July 12th, Italians and Germans are retreating to the east. It now becomes apparent to the Axis high command that Sicily will fall. To conserve their troop strength, they change their strategy from an island defense to a holding action that will allow three German divisions to escape to the Italian mainland. Anticipating this move, General Alexander revises the Allied battle plan. General George Patton's 7th Army is assigned to control the western half of the island, leaving the British forces free to cut off Messina, the only possible evacuation point for the enemy troops. American forces march 100 miles to the northern tip of Sicily and seize the capital city of Palermo on July 22nd. By now, the Italians are losing faith in their leader, Benito Mussolini. The invasion of Sicily was more than just a stepping zone to the Italian peninsula. Uh, the invasion of Sicily was the last straw for the Italians in World War II. It caused the overthrow of Mussolini, it prompted Italy to withdraw from the war, and in that respect, it, it accomplished a great deal for the Allies. Thereafter, the Germans had to continue their fight in the Mediterranean with only a few very dedicated Italian units to assist them. After being promised the glory of victory by both their Duce and Adolf Hitler, the Sicilians suddenly face the realization that they are a defeated people. Most Italians were fed up with the war by 1943. Some of them in Sicily simply wanted to tend their trees and be left alone by Axis and Allied alike. Other Italians, however, resented the Germans. They considered the Germans responsible for prolonging the agony even after the government at Rome had decided to surrender. And these Italians who resented the Germans actually in some cases assisted the Allies and ambushed the retreating Germans. of Sicily and the Italian surrender, it was obvious that the German troops on the island could not hold it by themselves. The German Corps commander, General Hube, uh, instead began to plan for an evacuation. He established a series of defensive lines leading towards the northeastern corner of the island. His intent was to delay the Allied advance on these different lines while he moved as many troops as possible off the island through the port of Messina. The Germans faced many problems in the uh, evacuation of Sicily. Withdrawing when you're in contact with an enemy like that is already probably the most complex form of military operation there is. And the Germans in this case had the additional problem uh, that once they broke contact, they had to pass their troops through the port of Messina, a 
across the Messina Straits, which was subject to Allied air and naval action. Given those factors, however, they inevitably would lose a few units, but overall, the German withdrawal was remarkably well conducted. The Germans enter Messina before the Allied troops arrive and find the town is heavily guarded. The Navy is engaged in a very active evacuation with landing barges and small ships continuously ferrying troops out of Messina to Italy. As the Germans withdrew from Sicily, they commandeered Italian vehicles so they could move more quickly. By August 17th, they had moved all their troops off the island and were retreating to the northeast through the toe of the Italian boot. By August 17th, over 60,000 men and 15,000 vehicles had been evacuated from Sicily to the Italian mainland. On that same day, the first units of General Patton's 7th Army move into Messina to find it deserted. The German forces succeeded in having completely disengaged themselves from us. There was no last minute fighting uh, block by block or yard by yard in the city of Messina. They cleared out and the city was empty when we got there. The city was quiet. There were Italians uh, around. Colonel Stanley Jubin would remain a part of the Italian campaign. After the invasion of Sicily, uh, the 39th engineers from my battalion continued on for the invasion of Salerno. We made the invasion landings at Anzio. In invading Sicily, the Allies believe they are striking at an easy entrance point to mainland Europe and that the Italians would be demoralized into surrendering. It is designed to be a body blow to the Axis. Although Mussolini is forced to abandon the war, the fighting itself is unexpectedly fierce and just a sample of what awaits the Allied armies in the long drive into Italy.